Good morning, everyone. I'd like to um, uh, start the morning off. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, 2017 segment of our Grand Rounds. As a, as a first uh, point of note, the initial uh, volume of the Journal of the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation will be launched on January 17, in nine days. So stay tuned. We're sending all the extra copies down to the Mayo Clinic so they know what's going on. And uh, we'll be anxious to hear. Now this morning, it, it's uh, coincidental that our first Grand Rounds of 2017 is also the first uh, Grand Rounds for Dr. Steve Bradley. Uh, Steve is our newest member of the cardiology section here. And we welcome him from Denver. Steve is uh, currently going to be the Associate Director of our Healthcare Innovation Program along with Craig Strauss. And we recruited Steve from Denver where he worked at the VA hospital and was National Associate Director for their cath lab uh, innovation and uh, delivery uh, efforts, I guess uh, would be the right way to say it. Steve is very interested in the uh, delivery of high quality health care at uh, efficient cost. And that's what he's going to be spending his time doing. And appropriately, the, the title of his presentation is uh, uh, health, uh, Delivering High Quality uh, uh, Cardiovascular Care. Now, I will tell you one other thing about Steve, that he won't toot his own horn very loudly, but he is the uh, only recipient this year of the Doug Zipes Distinguished Young Scientist award at the American College of Cardiology, and that, that is um, a, and a very prestigious award. Furthermore, uh, it represents, I think, as Steve and I were talking, a, a sea change in the focus at the uh, ACC with respect to uh, the importance of quality and cost, which is with Steve's uh, interest. So, Steve, we welcome you back to Minnesota. Thanks for uh, your willingness to do the grand round. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thanks for that kind introduction. Um, by way of introduction, as, as Scott mentioned, I was the associate director of this National Clinical Quality Program at the Denver VA. I was a clinical cardiologist there as well. So just a short period of time ago, this would have been my introductory slide, but I'm quite happy that this is now my introductory slide. Uh, by way of disclosures, so I have member, uh, served as a member of a couple of Thank you. A couple of different uh, appropriate use task force, rating task force, and I will talk about appropriate use criteria today. So just to have that in context when I'm speaking about those criteria. In addition, I've, I serve as a consultant to CMS in the development of a quality measure based on patient reported health status measures, and I will talk about the importance of patient reported health status measures and quality and value. So I was first introduced to this concept of value when I read this book, Redefining Healthcare, it's written by two Harvard Business School professors, Michael Porter on top and Elizabeth Teesberg on bottom. And I read this as required reading as part of my Master's of Public Health degree that I obtained during my cardiology fellowship at the University of Washington. And when I was reading it over that summer, I just finished my, my time as chief resident at Harborview Medical Center, and I thought this was amongst the worst books I've ever read. I didn't understand the concept, and I didn't understand how it would fit in healthcare delivery. It didn't fit in my understanding of how healthcare is delivered, and I wasn't the only one who felt this way. So Yui Reinhardt is a nationally renowned health economist, and he wrote that this was a utopian vision of a health system that might occur to anyone possessed of a modicum of common sense, but not too familiar with the real world of healthcare. And they had this very complex system that they thought that they needed healthcare to be completely redesigned around to achieve high quality uh, care, and I thought none of it made sense with the exception of one point that I've continued to come around to over time, is this concept of measuring the outcomes and costs for every patient. In the words of Deming, in God we trust all others must bring data. This idea of having the data to inform the quality and outcomes of the care that we're providing to identify opportunities to address gaps in our care and improve. So the objectives of my talk today are to first define what value is in healthcare. With that definition, I'll talk about 40 decades worth of work that have shown signals of low value care. I'll summarize that in about three slides. Then talk about the sources of and solutions to low value care and how we as an organization can compete on high value care. So first, what is value in healthcare? So I'll talk about these definitions mostly using the work of Michael Porter. So Porter and Teesberg wrote this book together. 
But Michael Porter really kind of embraced this concept and has made it the focus of his career since that time. So Porter describes value as the outcomes achieved by the patient relative to the cost of care to achieve those outcomes. So to achieve high value care, we can either improve our outcomes while maintaining cost stable or maintain high quality outcomes at lower cost or both improve our outcomes while reducing costs. So he describes these outcomes as kind of a tier of, of outcomes that are important. First and foremost, were they alive or dead? And what was the health status they achieved? Their symptoms, their functional status, their health-related quality of life. And then after that, how long did it take for them to get there and how sustainable was that health? He felt that these should be measured condition-specific. So for each medical condition a patient has, they should measure those outcomes important to that condition. I think there are challenges there when we think about our patients and that they have 10 to 15 medical problems and how do we measure all of the outcomes necessary for that, but that is his framework. And he also describes the cycle of care. So we should measure these outcomes for the cycle important for that care delivery process. In an acute care delivery setting, I think that's relatively easy to understand how that could be applied. In chronic care conditions, that becomes more challenging, but a challenge that we need to address. Another reason Porter focused on this concept of value is because he felt that the medical community was too diffuse in identifying what its quality aims were and that we needed a unifying quality aim to drive us forward. And he uses the example of the Institute of Medicine aims for high quality care in which they outlined six aims to achieve high quality care. Care that needs to be safe, effective, efficient, patient-centered, equitable, and timely. And Porter argues that by having these six different aims, it's never quite clear what the most important thing is as we become too diffuse in achieving our goals. But instead, if we use these six aims to achieve better outcomes at lower cost, we can be unified in our focus and achieve high value care and better quality care. Another thing that I think Porter overlooks is the importance of perspective. So as we mentioned, I came from the VA medical system where the perspective is relatively unified. But it becomes very different in other medical settings where the perspective of the patient, the clinician, the purchaser, the healthcare delivery system may have different concepts of what high value care, particularly as it relates to cost. So I think it's important that we keep those tensions in mind. There are opportunities in settings where the perspective is aligned and we need to leverage those opportunities first. And as we continue to move forward, think about how we change perspectives of different people involved to align our perspective to achieve high value care. But something that's often overlooked in considering value. So with that, I'll move on to summarize about 40 years worth of work in what has described evidence of low value care. And certainly concerns about value have been described for a long time because of the rising costs of care. I think it's somewhere in the order of 18 to 19 percent of GDP now. And for decades we've been yelling that our economy can't sustain this. Whether or not it can sustain that I think is less important than the fact that we see tremendous variation in our care delivery that suggests there are opportunities for improvement. We can't all be right if we're seeing this degree of variation. These, just, these variation studies started with the Dartmouth Institute, their atlas of healthcare. So this is a Dartmouth atlas for cardiac revascularization procedures, specifically for cutaneous coronary intervention. And the areas in dark blue are performing PCI at a rate of six times that in the areas of dark green. Now there could be a number of different reasons for this. One is potential differences in patient mix. Somebody mentioned welcome back home. So I did grow up in White Bear Lake, Minnesota. I did all my schooling in Wisconsin. I trained in Seattle and then I practiced in Denver prior to coming back to Minnesota. And I can tell you that my own personal BMI was different when I lived in Milwaukee than it was when I lived in Colorado. Beer, <laughs> sausage, and cheese, it's a cultural thing. So certainly there are differences in what the patient mix looks like that can contribute to differences in disease prevalence and how often medical care needs to be used. Another component of that is patient preferences. It's possible that in some areas of the country, patients prefer more care in their care delivery, and so that could contribute to utilization differences. But the folks at Dartmouth have thought about this long and hard, and so they've done studies to account for both patient mix and patient preferences. And they continue to see dramatic variation in the utilization. It's not associated with outcomes, suggesting that some of this variation is unwarranted and may be due to either underutilization, so failure to provide services to patients who would benefit, or overutilization, so using services to patients who aren't going to benefit, adding unnecessary cost to the system. And both of these could contribute to low value care. Subsequently, so these are all been utilization studies. People have tried to use clinical markers to try and understand is this variation truly warranted. And one of the more recent studies comes from the National Cardiovascular Data Registry, where uh, Manesh Patel and then Pam Douglas looked at rates of normal coronaries across cath labs. 
So they use a couple of different thresholds to, to define normal coronaries. The one that is most commonly accepted is all epicardial lesions less than or equal to 20%, so that green line. And what they found is the rate of normal coronaries across hospitals varied dramatically. Now, if we're using similar patient selection processes and utilization across facilities, we would expect that normal coronary rate to be relatively similar across facilities. That variation suggests differences in patient selection, differences in utilization across hospitals. One of the things that's been suggested as a reason is fee-for-service care. So we wanted to understand within the VA healthcare system that's capitated doesn't have that financial incentive that to either potentially overutilize or underutilize for patients without insurance that would cover, do we see similar variation? And in fact, we saw the same, if not more, variation within the VA. So this suggests to us this is not related to fee-for-service. There's something else going on. So here in the VA, we saw that of 22,000 patients, uh, nearly 5,000 had normal coronaries, but the rate varied from 6% at the lowest hospital to 49% at a median of 21. So again, changes in reimbursement alone are insufficient to address variation in use, and this is very important as we think about changes from a fee-for-service to alternate payment models, be it ACOs or bundled payment. That alone is not going to change variation in use. That alone is not going to fix all of the problems about variation. But the other problem is that these findings reflect variation in use. They really don't get at value. We don't understand of that variation, which facility is doing it right, which one is performing procedures at a rate that's optimizing patient outcomes at the lowest cost. So it raises questions still, can we identify low value care? And if we do, how do we improve on the value of healthcare? So with that, now I'll move on to the bulk of the talk, which is talking about the sources of and solutions to low value care. So again, using our value, a value uh, equation where outcomes are relative to cost, another framework for quality was proposed in 1998 and I think is really helpful in terms of thinking about the processes that actually contribute to low value care. So in this framework, Chasson talked about overuse, underuse, and misuse of care. So you defined overuse as care without anticipated benefit to the patient, underuse as the failure to provide care that improves health, and misuse as errors in care or inefficiency and waste. So I'll first focus on overuse. I'll talk about these in three different parts. So again, overuse would be care without anticipated benefit. And if this care has risk to the patient such that they could experience an adverse event, those adverse events would be unnecessary, would reduce our outcomes, reduce our numerator, and thereby diminish the value of our care. And, and concurrently, they're adding unnecessary cost to our healthcare system, increasing our denominator, reducing the value of our care. So I'll first talk about overuse and work that we've done using appropriate use criteria to, to attempt to identify potential overuse of care. So what are the appropriate use criteria? These were developed by the American College of Cardiology uh, in, in coordination with other specialty organizations to try and develop very specific guidelines for the utilization of services to direct high value care, high uh, appropriate uh, delivery of care. And it's essentially applying randomized chemical controlled uh, trial data and uh, printing clinical practice guidelines to specific clinical scenarios to determine the appropriateness of care. Appropriate care would be considered that care where the benefit outweighs the risk, and inappropriate would be considered where the risk outweighs the benefit. And it, by and large, when we're talking about inappropriate, we're talking about procedures that have no anticipated the benefit to the patient or overuse of care. The way these are developed, and as I said, I've, I've sat on a couple of rating panels, um, and as you'll see at the end of, when I, of this section, as a result of both sitting on that rating panel and then applying these in care, my perspective on these criteria has changed a lot over time, but I'll first describe how these are developed. So a writing panel is convened. That writing panel does a literature review and synthesizes the evidence, and at the same time, they generate a list of clinical scenarios. So in the setting of coronary revascularization, they came up with like 200 clinical scenarios. They provide those clinical scenarios and the evidence to a rating panel, and the rating panel says for each one of those clinical scenarios, is it appropriate, inappropriate, or do we not have enough evidence to really say is it uncertain? Each member rates it. They take the summary of those ratings, provide it back to the technical panel in a group meeting where everybody discusses the ratings. They go back and they individually rate them again, and they use the median score as the final appropriateness score. And the example of how these ratings come out then, this is an example for PCI. PCI would be considered more appropriate if it's an acute indication. So STEMI, non-STEMI, unstable angina are all uniformly appropriate. And then for elective uh, procedures, here we're seeing patients with low risk findings on non-invasive study, patients with higher uh, risk stress test findings, 
increasing burden of coronary disease, more symptoms, or on more antiangial medications would be considered more appropriate. One of the concerns about the appropriateness criteria is their validity. So certainly clinical practice guidelines are really only about a third of those guidelines are based on evidence. So if we're basing appropriate use criteria on evidence that's lacking, how valid are they, and, and segmenting where procedures are appropriate versus inappropriate. We did an analysis where we applied the appropriate use criteria retrospectively to the COURAGE trial data and looked at the symptom benefit of PCI relative to optimal medical therapy based on whether or not the procedure was considered appropriate, uncertain, or inappropriate. And here we're looking at a graph of angina frequency using the Seattle angina uh, score, angina frequency score, where a higher score is actually less frequent angina. And what you see is that the appropriate procedures had a clinically and statistically significant improvement in symptom burden, whereas uncertain or inappropriate PCI had uh, no statistic or clinically significant difference in, a per in symptom burden. So this provided to us some suggestion that these criteria had some validity behind them as we apply them to assessing quality of care. Subsequently, we applied these both to national and regional samples of uh, PCI performed in the United States and found similar to broad utiliz variation utilization, there was broad variation in the appropriateness of PCI. Here we're looking at hospital rate of inappropriate PCI procedures, and we see that the hospital median was around 11%, but ranged from 0 to 55%, suggesting that some hospitals were performing inappropriate elective PCI at a rate five times that of the median hospital rate. Based on that data, we, we had an interest. This is while I was a fellow at the University of Washington. We wanted to see if we could work with hospitals in a clinical quality improvement program to reduce the rate of inappropriate PCI and improve patient selection for elective PCI. So the COPE program is uh, the Clinical Outcomes and Assessment Program. It's a voluntary um, statewide program to submit data on revascularization procedures. Although it's voluntary, all but the VA hospital in Seattle, all hospitals in the state of Washington participate with the exception of the VA hospital. And so they submitted this data that allowed us to assess the appropriateness, and we'd feed that back to the individual hospitals as part of a quarterly feedback report that they had access to through a website, and then we would discuss at our annual statewide meetings uh, what trends and appropriateness were and, and how individual hospitals were doing, and looked over time to see what the impact was on inappropriate procedures. What we found over a, a three-year period of time was a 56% reduction in inappropriate PCI in the state of Washington. And what was encouraging was that that appeared to be a true reduction or true change in patient selection because of the change in the use of elective PCI for stable angina. If this had been because uh, of a change in documentation or a change in the way um, patients were being rated within uh, clinical data, we would have potentially seen an uptick in the use of PCI for unstable angina or other acute indications. But in fact, those stayed stable while there was a decline in stable angina. Now certainly, there's been a temporal decrease in the use of elective PCI for stable angina since the COURAGE trial, so this has been going on for some time, but the rate of deflection was steeper after the implementation of this quality improvement program. However, the, the change was not uniform across hospitals, so when we began to look at individual hospitals, and here we're looking by thirds, we saw about a third of hospitals had a rather large decline, another third essentially had no change, and a, a, a smaller third had uh, no change to maybe a slight increase. And the size of the circle represents the number of elective procedures those individual facilities are performing each year. And this is to us suggested, as you might expect, that facilities are acting differently in terms of whether or not they believe in the appropriate criteria, how they're applying them, how they're interacting with their referring providers to try and change patient selection practices. So we've subsequently gone back and done what's called qualitative research, which is interviews of people at, at these individual sites to try and understand what are the factors that are influencing uh, these rates of change. We're just in the process of putting that data together in a manuscript that will be forthcoming shortly. There are challenges to these criteria, though. So when I first started this work, I was a, boy, a first-year fellow, which is quite some time ago now. Um, and I really believed in the appropriate use criteria. I thought there was a potential to apply these, but increasingly I recognize that there are imperfections in the criteria. And one comes particularly uh, pertinent as you look at the data from the, the Minneapolis Heart Institute. So when I joined the group, one of the concerns was is that based on the data that's submitted to NCDR, the rate of elective inappropriate PCI is on the, on the order of about 30%. But looking at the specific patients who are submitted and rated as inappropriate, and I did this for the last quarter submitted to NCDR, they are by and large appropriate. And the challenge is that they don't fit into the appropriate criteria as they're defined currently. A common example is PCI prior to TAVR. 
We have a lot of patients at this institution who undergo TAVR. Ta uh, aortic valve disease and coronary disease go hand in hand. It's entirely appropriate and reasonable to do a PCI prior to that procedure, but it's not part of the current appropriate use criteria. And so those patients oftentimes are falling out. It's inappropriate because the documentation wasn't sufficient to support it in the limited clinical scenarios that are within the criteria. So I think there are challenges there, and that relates also to this idea of a living document. So the appropriate use criteria are intended to be updated as quickly as possible to reflect current evidence, but we know that evidence precedes changes in guidelines and certainly the appropriate use criteria by probably a couple of years. Now that's not a problem except for when we're using these to assess quality and then our payers and individuals look at our data and say, what is wrong with your facility that your rate of inappropriate PCI is so high? So I'm becoming less and less uh, enamored with the appropriate use criteria as a, a way to assess quality. I think there are other ways in which we can do better for the totality of our population. The other problem with the appropriate criteria relates not so much to the criteria themselves, but how we as clinicians can apply them or how healthcare systems can apply them. So as we become more familiar with what, what the data elements are that fit patients into certain boxes, if there are payers or others who are um, pressuring us to achieve appropriateness, it becomes relatively easy to change somebody from a class two to a class three angel severity because what is the difference really in clinical care? to achieve that appropriateness threshold. So I think there are certain limitations to the application, but the concept is a good one. I think the concept of addressing what are the quality outcomes that we're achieving and what are the, what are the indications, but there are clearly challenges to doing that in practice. So I'll now move on to talk about misuse or efficient use. This is, again, errors or inefficiency or waste in care delivery. So certainly errors can contribute to adverse events. If we're having adverse events that are unnecessary, Again, diminishing our outcomes, diminishing our numerator, and this is increasing our inefficiency, increasing our cost, diminishing our value. So we had an interest in trying to understand. We came to this concept of misuse kind of around a turn. We didn't intend to come to an understanding of misuse, but we were looking at readmission and value as it relates to elective PCI or PCI in general within the VA. Readmission has been this emerging quality measure. It's certainly a part of heart failure measures and increasingly a part of other measures of quality that have been proposed. And it's been proposed to be a quality measure for PCI as well. It's frequent. It varies by hospital. Some of it may be avoidable, and there was a thought that this may be contributing to low-value care. But it's never been studied to truly inform how much is readmission contributing to low-value care. So we wanted to look at that question. And we compared facility-level 30-day risk standardized readmission mortality and cost among 30,000 patients who received PCI within the VA. What we first found was when we compared mortality and cost by facility is that there was similar mortality across facility regardless of cost. So what we're seeing in the yellow are the risk standardized rates of mortality. On the black are the risk standardized costs. And we saw that mortality varied a small degree, not statistically significantly so, while, more, more, excuse me, while cost varied more than sixfold, very dramatic variation in cost, and these were not associated. Somewhat surprisingly, we found that readmission does not impact 30-day cost. Readmission, there was some degree, degree of variation in this, but in no way was associated with cost. And this didn't initially make sense to us. If readmission is common, it varies by hospital, and is thought to be related to total cost, why did we not see that within the VA healthcare system? And we got a little granular where the data became very, very clear. So readmission is actually a small proportion of overall 30-day total cost. The index procedure accounts for more than 80% of the total cost and varies dramatically from 60 to 92% of the 30-day total cost. So if readmission is this small proportion of the total cost and we've got a larger bulk of the cost related to index that varies so much, anything that happens after the patient leaves the hospital is going to be washed out by whatever your efficiency was up front in that index hospitalization. So this really got us rethinking where the opportunities for efficiency gains were. And around this time, I was at a conference um, for the International Consortium on Health Outcomes Measurement. And I was at a dinner sitting next to Tracy Spinks. And it turned out that Tracy was uh, director of head and neck cancer at MD Anderson. And she was working with a doctor by the name of Tom Feely to try and improve the value of head and neck cancer care delivery at MD Anderson. And I was speaking to her about what we were finding in our 30-day readmission uh, study of PCI. And I said, you know, it seems to us that there's variation in our index PCI, we need to get our hands around. She said, you know, that's exactly what we're finding for head and neck cancer care. We have unnecessary variation 
in our processes and practice. And so she and Tom Feely were working with a Harvard Business School professor by the name of Robert Kaplan to do Lean Six Sigma time-driven activity-based costing methods to identify inefficiencies in their process, streamline their processes, and also um, their, uh, their purchasing orders to reduce their costs and provide more efficient care. And they were leveraging this in terms of bundles with large payers and large employers to maintain their referral base for their head and neck cancer population. And so we began to work with uh, Dr. Kaplan and others to try and do similar work within the VA. And that's what's really continued to motivate me to think about what are the opportunities for efficiency gains uh, and reduction in costs while maintaining high value care. So I think the implications are that there are clearly opportunities to identify wasteful and inefficient care. Some of this relates to material goods. So what Dr. Kaplan and others have found as they do this head and, head and neck cancer, and they've moved on to do this in total knee and total hip for, for, ortho, uh, for orthopedic surgery. A lot of it relates to the supply chain. So how much you're paying for that implant has a dramatic implication in your total cost. And as you look at individual providers and get a sense of to who's using the expensive toy versus the less expensive toy, and is there really a difference in their clinical outcome? Can we come to some agreement about which, one, which implant we're going to use to leverage our purchasing power and reduce our costs for our supply chain? There are also aspects related to the care delivery, and so this is where Lean Six Sigma and this methodology from Kaplan comes in. I'm now a green belt in Lean Six Sigma. Don't, don't test me on my green belt skills, but, um, but I think you, learning these skills and applying them to our processes to improve our care is certainly an opportunity. I think there are also implications that we think as we think about changing to alternative payment models. I think there's a lot of concern about bundled payment and how do we as an organization get our hands around uh, the cost of care that happened outside of the walls of our facility. So if a patient goes out back to their community and we're no longer in charge of their primary care and their subsequent follow-up care, those are costs that we're being held accountable to that potentially have a significant impact on us. But I think in actuality, the bundle of the cost happens within our walls. And there's a tremendous opportunity to improve our efficiency, maintain our margin, and as we do that, then begin to think beyond our walls where the, I think the opportunity is actually less. So with that, I'll move on to the, the concept of underuse and really trying to provide some, va some balance to the concept of low-value low healthcare. I think oftentimes there's an overemphasis on overuse and an underemphasis on the potential for underuse. So again, underuse would be the failure to provide uh, care that improves patient health. This would be uh, care that would be suboptimal because we're not achieving the optimal patient outcomes and potentially it contributes to cost by adding additional downstream costs of care. So if a patient is diagnosed later, they may have additional hospitalizations that could have been avoidable, and their complications after their procedure may be higher than if they'd been taken care of sooner. So this really comes to this concept of achieving balance by measuring the right outcome. So it's important to keep in mind when we provide health care, a lot of what we do isn't intended to make patients live longer or reduce their risk of subsequent events. It's intended to make them feel better. We want to reduce their symptoms, improve their functional status, and improve their health-related quality of life. But when we measure the quality of our, our care, it's usually focused on mortality and did they have a recurrent MI. That's not what we're really intending to do a lot of the time. But we lack the outcomes of symptom burden, health status, and functional, uh, excuse me, and health-related quality of life to really understand the impact of our care. And if we don't have those outcomes, how can we measure value? So around the same time, at that same meeting that I was uh, having dinner with Tracy Spinks, I was having dinner um, with this person. And I don't know if you remember seeing at the very beginning, I showed a, a picture of a person who looked very similar. Um, and so I introduced myself to her, and she said she was Elizabeth Teesberg. And I, said, I asked her what she did, and she said I kind of wrote a book on the subject. I remembered, oh yeah, she wrote that book that I hated when I was a Master of Public Health student, but now I actually really appreciate it. So, I asked her what her motivation was for writing the book about redesigning healthcare, and she said, "Well, she was um, when her son was young, he was sick, and so he was engaged with the healthcare system very frequently. And every time that they would leave the hospital, about a week later, they'd get a survey in the mail that asked them, "What did you think about the food? How was the lighting? Were we polite to you? Were we, you know, were the floors clean?" She said. I wasn't bothered so much that they were asking me questions and asking me to service, but they were asking the wrong question. Nobody asked, how are you? Is your son less nauseous? Is he moving around more? Is his pain better controlled? Nobody was asking the important questions. And so this really struck home to this concept of we're not asking the right questions to the patient to understand the value of our care. Fortunately, the instruments to do this exist. We've been applying them in clinical research for decades. 
So these patient-reported health status measures are these valid, sensitive, reproducible measures that get at what are patients' symptom burden, what is their functional status, what are their health-related quality of life. The Seattle Angie questionnaire has been applied in the COURAGE trial in multiple studies of medications, uh, AFib studies for ablation, heart failure, the Minnesota living with heart failure, the KCCQ12, KCCQ uh, is now part of TAVR implementation and capture of that for CMS reimbursement. So we have these measures. They've been applied in clinical, excuse me, in clinical trials. We haven't applied them in clinical practice. And so this international consortium of health outcomes measurement has really glommed onto this idea that we need to create standard measure sets that we're going to hold everybody accountable to to measure. And they include kind of the traditional measures of mortality and stroke and revascularization, but they also include these health outcome measures of angina, dyspnea, depression, functional status, using these uh, validated measures. But the challenge that ICHOM has really overcome is, the, is how do we actually put this into clinical practice? It's one thing to measure a 12-item or a 24-item instrument survey in a clinical trial where you've got research dollars to have somebody do that and do it in follow-up. We're all too busy to sit down and administer three or four surveys for four different clinical conditions in our, in our clinical care delivery. So how do we actually administer these things in practice? Then how do we score them and interpret them in a way that we can act on them in our clinical care delivery and routine care? And this is something that ICHOM has struggled with and really has had problems in terms of implementing these standard sets that they've thought about. When I was at the VA, we really tried to take this on by developing a system that would administer, score, interpret, and provide these scores back to clinicians outside of the walls of routine care delivery. So within the VA, the technology is not that all, all that advanced, so we were, we were dependent on an automated phone system. When I say automated phone system, most people in the audience groan because the idea of a phone calling them and administering a survey is something most of us would hang up on instantly. The VA population is a little different. They like weird stuff. But uh, at any rate, what would happen is when a consult was put into the electronic health record for a procedure in a cath lab, whether or not it was a coronary, peripheral vascular, or EP procedure, it would trigger the system to call the patient and then administer the disease-specific survey that went along with whatever procedure they were going to get. The patient would respond to the survey questions by typing in the answers to each question that would capture the data, and then it would populate the electronic electronic health record with the results of that survey to inform what their health status deficit was prior to considering this procedure. Then if they went on and had a procedure for this example, we're using PCI, that would trigger the phone system to call them and follow up, administer the survey, and see what the impact was on their health status. So it gave us the opportunity to capture, interpret, provide, and get this data in a way that we can understand the value of our care without adding burden to clinical providers. And then the intent was to provide these reports back to the clinician in primary care for longitudinal care delivery. So in the primary care setting, a patient with angina would be, question, would be called on an uh, on a every so often basis, would ask these questions, obtain the data, and then provide it back to the primary care provision, clinician. And if there was a, a clinically significant decline, it would trigger, trigger the uh, provider to consider a cardiology consultation to address what's happened in their decrement in health status. So it really is a thinking about how do we do these things in a way that doesn't add a clinical burden but allows us to understand the value of our care. So with that, that again summarizes overuse, misuse, and underuse. And I'll finish with talking about how we can compete on high value care with thinking about these concepts of achieving better outcomes at lower cost. So I think that some organizations have really started to take this to heart. So the Cleveland Clinic is a prime example where because of their transparency and their understanding of their outcomes relative to the cost, they've leveraged that understanding to go to large employers and large payers to say, hey, we'll provide you bundled care for certain services if you send us your stream of patients. And this really hit home uh, when I was in Seattle and Boeing announced at our state meeting that they were sending their patients to the Cleveland Clinic for their bypass surgeries from then on. And you could have heard a pin drop in the room as the people thought about what the implications were both for their current uh, stream of patients and in the future. CMS is also starting to leverage this concept of value through their alternative payment models. And the most uh, recent examples are the comprehensive care for joint replacement. So this is a 90-day payment bundle in 75 metro areas. And this concept of health status capture is embedded within this uh, program as well because if you do health status capture on a certain number of patients, it bumps your quality measure, which then is multiplied by your payment. So there's an opportunity to increase your payment by just capturing the data. And it's moving facilities towards this idea of capturing health status as part of routine care to monitor the value of their care. 
There's been this recent uh, uh, release of the episodic payment models for AMI and Cabbage, 90-day payment bundles in 98 metro areas. Uh, the Twin Cities metro area is not among those payment bundles, but again, based on what we understand about the index procedural costs and variation, I think there's still an opportunity for us to identify opportunities for efficiency gain, maximize both our margin and the value of our care, and then this is likely going to expand from 98 to everybody, and we will be well prepared for when that change happens. And then finally, this hospital-level patient-reported outcome-based performance measure for elective PCI is a long way of saying that CMS is looking at the development of a health status measure as a quality measurement for elective PCI. And this is where I sit as a consultant to CMS in the development of this health status measure. That measure is, has gone through development, um, both through the consultation phase and through the task force. It's now gone through public comment, and they're in the phase of pilot implementation now with the hopes of incorporating this as a quality measure for elective PCI probably in about two years' time. So I think the time is now to get ahead, to see around the curve, to skate to where the puck is going to be on achieving high-value care. So what's needed to compete? I already said that I've bought into this concept of outcomes and costs for every patient, and that I really agree with that. But it's not just about measuring those things. You need some way in which you can pull that data together in a way that you identify the, challenge, the, the variation in your processes, the variation in your outcomes, and the variation in your costs. And that's really based on this enabling informational te information technology platform. And that was a part of what we had in the VA through our electronic health record and our clinical quality program. And that was a huge part of why I was interested in joining uh, the Minneapolis Heart Institute Center for Healthcare Delivery Innovation, because that those necessary pieces exist for us to achieve uh, high-value care. And so the, the HDI is leveraging existing data infrastructure to identify problems and cost outcomes and processes of care and providing a multi-level view of variation and efficiency. So both at the, at the unit of uh, our service line, of individual hospitals, of individual providers, and across individual processes, where are the opportunities to optimize our uh, efficiency and optimize our patient outcomes? And so it's really addressing quality gaps and unnecessary variation in healthcare delivery through novel patient-centered solutions that optimize patient experience and health outcomes while reducing cost. And the HDI has been very successful in this already. So a couple of examples. One is using the data to identify variation in the use of bleeding avoidance strategies for patients undergoing PCI at high risk of bleeding, and then leveraging that data to induce a clinical change to target bleeding avoidance strategies to patients at high risk. Another example comes from the data to demonstrate the impact of postoperative AFib on cost and outcomes, and then identifying opportunities to reduce post-op AFib to improve outcomes and reduce costs. And a third example comes from uh, carotid endarterectomy and vascular surgery and reducing ICU utilization after carotid endarterectomy. Again, improving efficiency is reducing costs but maintaining patient outcomes to achieve high value care. And these three examples are really just the tip of the iceberg. Craig could provide you probably another 30 that have been done thus far. But I think the opportunities beyond that are hopefully with us working in partnership multifactorial in terms of what we can get. And it's just going to grow. So I've talked about the data sources that are coming through electronic uh, data warehouse, but the data is going to get larger and larger. And so we need people with a good clinical focus and understanding of the data in terms of how we're going to apply this in routine clinical care to achieve better outcomes at lower cost while leveraging the perspective of value so that everybody wins. So with that, I'll conclude by saying that there's clearly evidence of variation in, in healthcare value. I think it's attributable to misuse, overuse, and underuse, and all can be addressed, but they need to be addressed in a way that maintains the uh, understanding of the different perspectives of value on healthcare and how to align those perspectives. And then finally, improving healthcare offers a strategic advantage that aligns us with the, the goals of patients. Thank you very much. It's exciting to be here. I'd like to provide, just say thanks to the folks that have joined recently the HDI and folks that I've worked with over the past decade or so. Thank you. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Uh, it's great to have you here. Thanks, John. Uh, when you look at our systems, and I know you've had a chance to do so, are there holes in the kind of data you can extract that can help to answer a lot of these questions and thinking about how do we actually decrease our real costs and make a difference and be able to have bundle payments and other things? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll, first, I'll take that as kind of a two-part question, even though it's only one question. So are there holes? Absolutely. 
Um, so uh, Scott stopped me in the hall the other day to ask me about a research question he was interested in. And I said, well, the challenge is, is that you've got structured and unstructured data. And Scott stopped and he said, hold on there, you're talking a different language I don't understand. <laughs> but I think that to recognize that there are certain data elements that are pulled out in a way that they fit into boxes every time. And that's what's called structured data. And then we can take those boxes and align them and say what's going on in those different boxes. A lot of our data remains in unstructured form, so in text form. Uh, the examples that I like to use are both in stress test reports, where we've got just this blurb of text, but it's not aligned in a way that we can identify patients who had a positive stress test and say, did they subsequently get the care that they needed? Or another example comes from patients who will go and get ankle brachial index testing. You don't have that structured way to say, who are the patients who had a positive test? That, did they go on to see vascular surgery and get the care that we needed? So there are huge gaps and increasing needs to identify where do we need to move to a structured format or think about other approaches. So there's natural language processing that can, at least for some simplistic questions, do that for you by searching the text and finding out what it's supposed to be. Um, and then in terms of the cost, also a challenge. So I'm just becoming familiar with the costing approaches that's used by Lyme and MHI. But oftentimes costs are attributed to a certain um, a certain area kind of in a peanut butter schmear. And so you can get a sense of what the problem is, but what's the exact process that's contributing to that cost? So that's where this time-driven activity-based costing gets in is if you identify a large chunk, maybe you need to get in there and get real granular about what are the steps of the process that are contributing to that and what are the costs associated with that. There's a tension there because there's a lot of work, a lot of man hours involved in doing that type of granular work. But so in a long way of saying, yes, there are holes, and I think you need to be real strategic about where are we going to devote our resources to address those holes. I echo John. It's just really outstanding uh, information, and it's nice to have people around here that understand things that I have no concept of whatsoever. Um, but then all of you have felt that way for a long time about me. Um, you know, you talked about the variability in the PCI costs and, you know, the dramatic, even across the VA. And how much of that is, you know, and, and we at MHI can control some things and we at Alina can't control other things, so to speak. How much of those type of things are physician driven? How much of those are, are, are fixed costs? Can, can you comment on that? Yeah, so we were just in the process of starting to try and leverage our AD cath labs to understand what, what were the driving factors. And so we had taken trips to the Pittsburgh VA. Um, I leveraged a trip to the Minneapolis VA to see family. And then we had the Denver VA as a, as a base example as well. And so I'll use a couple of kind of um, low-hanging fruit identification. So at the Denver VA, we had a post-procedural area that essentially closed at 4 in the afternoon. So if we had a patient who finished up and, and was going to need to be monitored past 4, that patient had to be admitted to the hospital. There was no other pathway. The Pittsburgh VA and the Minneapolis VA had a 24-5 observation unit, procedural observation unit, where patients who were post-colonoscopy, post-cath, whatever it was, would go there and hang out. And so if they were ready to go home at 8 o'clock in the evening and they lived close enough, they would go home. And so you're reducing your length of stay by about a day, which is a dramatic component of cost. The other thing to keep, so that was one part. It was driven by the processes and the structure of how this done it. There are challenges there. It's not just about saying, oh, we're going to open up a 24-5 unit at the VA. You've got to have the resources in terms of the nursing and the, and the space, and you've got to talk to the unions about whether or not they're going to do that. The other part of it, so the VA, a common misconception is that the VA has national contracting for its um, for its stents or any any implant. They have some degree of contracting, but then they'll often go outside of that contract. And so just how well they were using that, how well they were staying within their contract, had a huge implication on cost. If they ran out, they said, oh, I've got to use my charge card to get a few because we need them. The costs were dramatically higher because they weren't efficient in their uh, in their sources for their, for their implants. So those were a couple of examples that came about from the work that we did. There are some of those things are also likely physician driven. So I talked about you know, the work that uh, Kaplan did with these hip and knees. They found that some implanters really liked that new knee or that new hip that cost three times as much as the one that was a little older. So having those conversations amongst the group about can we come to some agreement about which device we're going to use 
to maximize patient outcomes as best we can while maintaining costs. Steve, thanks for your discussion. It's uh, great to hear these uh, kind of quality comments come out again. Um, I, you know, I, I've worked in this area for a, a long time, and um, I, I've kind of tried to take it in a simplistic approach. There's kind of two big categories of quality. There's that which um, I think we could understand as administrative quality, and there's bedside quality. And a lot of the work, oh, and then if you look at the definition of value, there's either outcomes or there's cost. And I align many times administrative quality with cost and bedside quality with outcomes. And um, this work really focuses, of course, on administrative quality. It's the kind of quality work that you can do in your office. You can do it over in the line of headquarters. You can actually do it from your home. And I think it's very important as we look at the cost of, say, stents, or if we look at bundled payments, and, um, and that's all important to the work that we do. Uh, on the other hand, clinical quality or bedside quality is really what this practice has been all about over the years because the overwhelming majority of us that, that work here work at the bedside. And you showed one slide at the end of this slide of three bedside quality projects that we did very successfully. The, the sad news is, is that every one of these projects started many years ago. And over the last three years, we essentially have lost a focus on clinical bedside quality. And for those of us that see these patients every day, and I just got off a of hospital service and I spend a lot of time in outreach, there's innumerable opportunities for us to improve the care that we provide. And I think sometimes when we look at our registry data, we say, well, we kind of fall between the bars and therefore we're good enough. But I think it's important that uh, Minneapolis Heart Institute continue to strive to make better better. And the work at the bedside is harder work, in my opinion, um, because it has to engage all of us. And I would just encourage you and Craig and Pam that are involved in this work that you really strive to redevelop what was developed on this slide. So I think I appreciate that comment. So I think, just to summarize, I think it's all hard work. Um, and the other component of this is I think that the real opportunities lie in clinical quality improvement. Uh, the challenges sometimes are, are the issues and gaps of the data that drive us in terms of where to go. So uh, another example, um, there was a summer, summer intern who looked at the use of, so I didn't talk about big data. I could do a whole other talk about the use of big data. I think one of the big opportunities for big data is for case finding. So, as we think about new technologies or new therapies that come out, identifying the patients in our population who are eligible for that therapy that is going to improve their outcomes and potentially reduce their costs. An example is the use of CRTD. It's not really new anymore. But if we look at our patient population and we identify patients who have reduced EF, prolonged QRS, and are eligible for the therapy, we've got patients out in the wilderness who aren't getting this. And so we can leverage our data to identify the opportunities to do that case finding and improve our clinical quality marrying those things together. So I completely agree with you, and it's thinking about what are the aspects of clinical quality that we're going to, either the data is already in hand or we need to make our data more robust so that we can achieve those opportunities. Any other questions? Thank you. That was a phenomenal talk. It's great to see uh, close by that. The so a common soul here from the VA system doing phenomenal work. My question is, has to do with PCI and the high risk cases. You mentioned before that this is a problem there because of the cost being higher and the outcomes may not be as good as it would be in elective cases. And that's been always a strive for the complex PCI group that uh, outcomes always get shown as a suboptimal, although in reality these are very high cases that wouldn't be doing well otherwise. That's your comments on the balance between the risk of the patient starting with how well you can kind of um, adjust for the baseline risk versus what comes out in the end. Yeah, there are tremendous there are tremendous challenges and risks about just how far we push these concepts, right? And so Jamin McCabe is a good friend of mine who's at the Seattle or is out in Seattle and previously was at Harvard and has done a lot of work showing the implications of public reporting on patient selection and as a res as a result, reduction in utilization of PCI for the highest risk patients that may benefit the most, right? So as a result of pushing the envelope on trying to risk adjust, changing provider behavior in a potentially an adverse way. 
So I think that's something that really needs to be thought about. It oftentimes lies at a policy level about how we're going to do these things. I ran into um, I ran into some just the other day, and they were talking about their cardiac surgery and, and how you know the change in the new year, and as a result, their denominator goes back to zero, and they hope that nothing bad happens in the next month because they're going to look like an outlier. Like, why are we doing silly stuff like setting annual timelines instead of a rolling timeline that's going to adjust to when events happen? You know, that, that type of stuff lies at a policy level, and certainly we can have discussions about that because we are the folks who are going to be working with them about the data that we have. So that's a, an important tension about using this data to improve quality. Just a follow up on Dr. Hurl's point, um, and great, great talk, outstanding talk. I'm obviously uh, uh, very happy to have you here, and I think there's tremendous opportunity for us to improve. And I think this is an invitation to everyone in MHI that we have a data infrastructure that is really second to none across the country, and we have an opportunity to take ideas that you or others would have and put some structure around it and make changes to it. So this is an invitation to everybody that's a part of MHI and a part of Alina to help us uh, identify those right clinical improvement opportunities and to make them happen. Absolutely. One more thing as a follow-up. If you could help us know where the ripest targets are and what we need to do to further invest in the infrastructure to answer those questions, then we might actually get funding to do those things because you would have an endpoint that would be beneficial. Yep, absolutely. Thank you very much. Dr. Lesser is going to be our speaker next week at Grand Round, so have a great week. Thank you. Thank you.